So in today's video, it's one that hundreds of you have spammed me for. It's Abby Sharp's recent SIBO diagnosis video. Roll the titles. For the record, I'm done trying to make y'all comfortable. For the record, you ain't trying to grow any stuff for you. So in March 2020, Abby said this about SIBO. Well, SIBO does actually exist. At the moment, we just don't have a fantastic way to diagnose it yet. Then just a few days ago, Abby puts out this video about being diagnosed with SIBO. Next, how do we even test for SIBO? Thankfully, there is a diagnostic breath test. So one year ago, we have no testing which is accurate. 12 months later, I have used testing which I said was inaccurate to get a SIBO diagnosis. Makes sense, yeah? Now the internet will always bite you in the backside when you put out inaccurate information. And today is one of those days for Abby. Now I'm not making this video to be an idiot towards her. I want her to get healthy and well as quickly as possible. I'm making this video because people like Abby and myself have a duty of care to their audiences over the information that they put out. Putting out videos one minute saying that SIBO tests are invalid and then the next minute I have used them to get a SIBO diagnosis creates a lot of confusion for people. And it's even worse when the science over lactulose breath tests have remained consistent for the last 10 years or so. We know their benefits and we also know their limitations, but for most people they are far more preferential than invasive biopsies to diagnose SIBO. Anyway, testing aside, in today's video we're going to pull apart some of Abby's main inaccurate statements. In her video titled, I tested positive for SIBO for my extreme bloated belly. Now Abby's video is 30 minutes long so I'm not going to review the whole video because you would be here all day listening to me pull that video apart and nobody wants that. But what I will do is pull out some of her most bizarre statements and show you how inaccurate they are. And like I said before, I'm not doing this to have a dig at Abby, rather so people understand how they can fix these issues as quickly as possible, and they are not spending a year modifying their diet to control symptoms. If Abby had dealt with these issues a while ago correctly, then there is a very high probability that her digestive issues would be long gone by now. Anyway, to the video. So I just got the call, um, I got my results back, and not surprising, they are positive. And you'd think I was like upset about this, like a positive <laughs> diagnosis for anything is usually kind of a scary deal. But in this case, it means that, you know, there's something there and there's something we can do about it. Um, and there's actual, you know, medications that can help treat this. It's not just necessarily something I'm gonna have to live with for the rest of my life, like something just like straight up mysterious, like IBS. This is true if you treat the SIBO correctly. And what I mean by this is that you have to address the underlying factors that is allowing the SIBO to stay in the gut. Yes, you can take an antibiotic to treat SIBO or an antimicrobial, and they will get rid of the infection from the gut. But if that's all you do, then the infection will likely come back fairly quickly. After removing the infection from the gut, you want to ensure that you rebuild and repopulate the gut with the right type of bacteria from things like fermented foods. And you also aid digestion for around three to six weeks with things like HCL and also digestive enzymes. If you don't do this and the food is not being broken down correctly, then this can start impacting on your gut motility or transit times. If your food and feces start backing up, you can then get a migration of bacteria from the colon into the small intestines and the infection can then start up again. So I'm actually really relieved. And my results showed that it was actually methane bacteria dominant, which was which was surprising to me based on my symptoms because methane bacteria usually results in more constipation, whereas hydrogen bacteria tends to be more diarrhea. So just on this point, there are three main types of SIBO, hydrogen, methane, and also hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen-based SIBOs are usually associated with loose stools and diarrhea, while methane, like Abby said, is typically associated with constipation type problems. But many people fluctuate between between the two. TMI, I know, but that's typically what we see clinically. But the hydrogen bacteria can actually be masked when methane bacteria is present because the methane bacteria feeds on the hydrogen bacteria, which can make the hydrogen numbers look um, lower than they actually are. So it's actually quite possible that I have a bit of both. Feasibly, yes, but again, it would have been good to see her test results. So my official SIBO treatment plan was to be as follows. I would start the process with two weeks 
on a biofilm disruptor. So over the last four years, I've seen many, many people for SIBO related issues. And you can see some of these case studies in my case studies playlist. Not to one of these people have I ever recommended a biofilm disruptor. These are marketing buzzwords to sell supplements. There is also zero credible evidence anywhere that taking a biofilm disruptor will improve your SIBO outcomes. But let's see what Abby says on the matter. A biofilm is an extracellular matrix that protects the bacteria from stressors like an antibiotic. So think of it like the beehive protecting the colony inside. You ideally want to break down the biofilm before you attack the colony, so to speak. And side note, before you come at me, I'm not suggesting that we kill bees. I love bees, we need bees, but we don't need SIBO. So there are many inaccuracies with what Abby is saying there. So let's first explain what a biofilm is. Biofilms are composed primarily of microbial cells and extracellular polymeric substances. EPS may account for 50 to 90% of the total organic carbon of biofilms and can be considered the primary matrix material of the biofilm. EPS may vary in chemical and physical properties, but it is primarily composed of polysaccharides. And what are polysaccharides? They are long chain carbohydrates or sugars. So let's give Abby the benefit of the doubt and say that you have to take something to remove the biofilm, which you don't, before you can eradicate the SIBO. Well, if the main constituent parts of biofilms are polysaccharides, that are sugars, why wouldn't you just take an inexpensive digestive enzyme that will help break down the carbs and sugars? As soon as those enzymes come into contact with polysaccharides, they will start breaking down those biofilms very, very quickly. The issue is though that people like to sell products. Put bio film disruptor on a bottle and you can charge three times the amount as you can for an inexpensive digestive enzyme. But again, the main point here is that there is zero credible evidence anywhere that biofilm disruptors help improve SIBO outcomes. And Abby, if you or any of your medical team would like to have a live discussion about this, then I would love to speak to you. Like I said before, I have helped many, many people resolve their SIBO infections and not one has required a biofilm disruptor. So please don't get caught up in this marketing hype. Next, after two weeks trying to break down the biofilm, I was to begin a two week protocol of an antibiotic called Rifaximin, plus an herbal microbial called Alimax Pro, which is basically a high potency allicin supplement, which has been shown to help with SIBO, particularly methane dominant SIBO as an adjunct. So a few things here, rifaximin is the go-to antibiotic of choice to resolve SIBO infections. It's designed so that it's not absorbed into the body compared to broad spectrum antibiotics like amoxicillin. So for example, if you have a tooth infection and you take amoxicillin, it will go through the stomach into the small intestines and be absorbed into the bloodstream where it will be circulated around the body and help fight the tooth infection. Rifaximin on the other hand is non-digestible. So you take the rifaximin, it goes through the stomach, through the small intestines and through through the colon, and any time it comes into contact with pockets of bacteria, it trims them back. So that is how Rifaximin works, and now to Abby's comments that she took Alimax Pro alongside Rifaximin to boost the chances of fixing the problem. There is nowhere in that study that Abby puts up on screen to even remotely suggest that taking Alimax or other antimicrobials alongside Rifaximin will increase your outcomes of success for removing SIBO infections. What it does say is that SIBO is widely prevalent in tertiary referral gastroenterology practice. Herbal therapies are at least as effective as rifaximin for resolution of SIBO by lactulose breath test. Herbals also appear to be as effective as triple antibiotic therapy for SIBO rescue therapy for rifaximin non-responders. It goes on to say further prospective studies are needed to validate these findings and explore additional alternative therapies in patients with refractory SIBO. Now again, this is usually just another money-making scheme by certain practitioners. They mislead their patients that adding in natural antimicrobials alongside rifaximin will increase the chances of success. By doing so, the practitioner will, in many cases, sell the antibiotic and also the antimicrobial and make even more money. Just to repeat though, there is zero credible evidence anywhere that you need to do this or that it's even effective. For a high proportion of patients, they just need to take the rifaximin at the recommended dose or the antimicrobials at the recommended doses, and that will resolve the infection if they are taken for long enough. 
Again, I've seen many, many patients for SIBO and routinely work alongside doctors in the UK who will prescribe rifaximin. And to date, not one of these patients has ever taken antimicrobials alongside rifaximin. This is an absolute non-essential, simply save your money. Again, there are stronger options for this since most people do need to be taking two antibiotics to really kill off the bacteria. But of course, they aren't safe in pregnancy, so we had to take like a gentler route. This is another bizarre statement with no evidence to substantiate it. So again, I've been involved in the treatment process of a lot of people with methane dominant SIBO, just like Abby is experiencing. Not one of these has had to take a second antibiotic alongside rifaximin for treating their SIBO. There are clearly non-responders to rifaximin and they just simply swap out to something else. But again, there is zero credible evidence anywhere that taking two antibiotic treatments together will give you a substantial beneficial outcome compared to taking a single dose therapy. Now, this was actually the fun part because it meant that I got to eat a lot of the FODMAPs that I've been pulling back on since the theory goes that well-fed bacteria are more active and therefore easier to kill. Again, there is no credible evidence anywhere that increasing the level of carbohydrates in the diet will make the bacteria feed more and thus make them more susceptible to antibiotic intervention. And the little study that Abby flashed on screen has zero to do with SIBO infections and more to do with tuberculosis bacteria in guinea pigs, so it's completely irrelevant. Now, you'll also find practitioners who recommend the opposite, and that is to starve the bacteria but generally this is a recommendation for folks doing an all natural herbal protocol, which typically will take a bit longer to see results. Abby is correct that herbal treatments will take maybe two to three times the length of time that rifaximin will take to eradicate SIBO. She also says that some practitioners will also recommend starving the bacteria by minimizing or avoiding higher FODMAP foods in the diet. The problem with this is that if you starve the bacteria in the small intestines, you will also starve the bacteria in the large intestines. The average healthy person will have 600 to 1,000 species of bacteria in the colon, which forms your microbiome. And these colonies of bacteria will help ferment fibers, break down compounds within your food, such as oxalates, as well as produce things like short-chain fatty acids. So for many people, starving the bacteria is the worst possible thing they can do. You starve the bacteria in the colon and reduce the diversity. You then start to lose the capacity to ferment fiber and carbohydrates as efficiently, and then this starts to cause an impact on your transit times. If you start increasing the transit time in the colon, you will start getting a backing up of the food and feces, and this can start triggering the migration of bacteria from the colon into the small intestines. And this is one of the main mechanisms in which SIBO will stay inside your gut. And it really did. After two weeks of treatment, I was feeling super great and probably about 60% better. So we decided to do another two weeks of treatment to kill off the rest of the bacteria. Yes, this is common practice with SIBO. Depending on the severity of the infection, some people will need two, three, or even four cycles of rifaximin therapy. But that's when it started to go downhill. So I'm on my third week, so basically the second round of antibiotics. And it's not like they're not working, but I'm definitely plateauing. Like I, I was doing this, in terms of feeling better. And now I'm doing So I mean, I don't know what's going on. I'm taking the same drug. You'd think that things would continue to move in a positive way, but looks like we've reached a plateau. And I was never able to feel that good again. There is a simple explanation for this type of plateau. SIBO isn't just one type of bacteria, it can be many different bacterial species. So no antibiotic will be effective for all types of species at all times. Rifaximin will eradicate many species easily and others it will have little to no effect. Now in Abby's situation, she probably eradicated a reasonable amount of the bacteria initially and then after this, the predominant species left were potentially unaffected by the rifaximin. So for many people in this situation, you would simply need to cycle to different antibiotics or different antimicrobials. In the people that I see, a large proportion would simply need to take rifaximin to clear the infection. But I would say in 15 to 20% of people, they may have to adopt some form of rotation. After the fourth week, I moved on to the third maintenance stage, which was to come off of the antibiotics and start a prokinetic agent to promote motility and prevent the bacteria from pooling and flourishing. 
Abbey, as she said, was only around 50 to 60% improved, and those bacteria will continue to replicate. So taking a prokinetic to help with your transit times is going to do little to prevent the bacteria from multiplying. The only way you would do this is by removing the infection from the gut fully. Basically, a prokinetic stimulates and coordinates gastrointestinal motility to help support what we call the migratory motor complex, or MMC. So the MMC moves bacteria down the large intestine every 130 minutes or so between meals and not having an adequate or strong enough MMC is thought to play a role in SIBO because the bacteria can basically hang out and populate in the bowel. So we went with ginger as our prokinetic because the pharmaceutical options, again, aren't safe in breastfeeding and ginger does have some evidence to support its use in reducing SIBO. Correct, but if you still have 50% of the infection remaining in your small intestines, multiplying and increasing, then taking a ginger supplement will do little or nothing to help with this. Natural prokinetics such as Iberogast or ginger, or even pharmaceutical types, can be administered to help maintain gut motility, so as you are killing off the infection, your bowel movements remain consistent, and the migration of bacteria from the colon to the small intestines is limited. But if you haven't removed the SIBO infection from the gut, then this is all irrelevant, because the infection will just take hold of the small intestines again, and no improvement to your migrating motor complex is going to fix this. It's a bizarre approach that her team is making her go through. So, I just finished the second round of the antibiotics, so four weeks, and it's like my body just got used to and enjoyed the royal treatment and completely shut down. Like I'm really constipated right now and I am never constipated. Constipation is not my issue. I'm also seemingly reacting to like FODMAP foods that were not an issue before, like dairy. When I did my low FODMAP elimination trial, dairy did not come up as one of my main triggers. Okay, so there are a couple of points to discuss here. So the first one is that I see a lot of people for SIBO infections who have propped themselves up on low FODMAP diets and lower carb approaches to help control symptoms. And for some people, these are effective. But what these people aren't realizing is that by going low FODMAP, you're often cutting off the food supply to the bacteria in the colon, and this will reduce the bacterial diversity in your microbiome. The issue with this is that you need a decent range of bacteria in this area to ferment the fiber that you're eating and help break this down. This fermentation process is what keeps things moving along in the colon, along with peristalsis and also the migrating motor complex. Therefore, if you've been on a lower FODMAP diet for a longer period of time and your diversity is low, and then you take antibiotics like Abby has done for four weeks, then it can have the potential to trip up issues with constipation and food intolerance tolerances, etc. So quite simply, don't modify your diet to control symptoms, as you will pay the consequences over the longer term, and for many, it is even more difficult to get the higher FODMAP foods back into the diet. Mark my words, watch what happens to Abby over the next 18 months. The issues will simply get worse and worse. Like I've always been fine with dairy. I love dairy. But now I have a single spoonful of cottage cheese or a spoonful of ice cream, and I'm in rough shape even if I take a lactate. So I do not know what's going on right now. Exactly, as I said before, you have reduced the capacity of your gut to break down these foods and you are now paying the consequences of this. Also common sense, but don't eat ice cream when you're trying to resolve these types of problems. Also, I had like a few pieces of cauliflower off my kid's plate last night and I was in the fetal position all night in pain. So yeah, that was a tease. That was an honestly brutal tease and I don't know where we go from here. I'll tell you where you go. You work on removing the remainder of the SIBO infection from the gut, and then you work on recolonizing the gut with fermented foods, etc. You then don't have the excessive fermentation in the small intestines, and the fibers and carbs traveling through the colon are adequately broken down and don't cause many of the issues that Abby has discussed. That felt like a real blow. I had finally gotten a taste of freedom where I wasn't in pain or discomfort every night before bed and it all just got ripped away. Super depressing, I'm not gonna lie. So yeah, I basically just waited for my appointment to find out next steps. It'll be super interesting to see what advice Abby received here. Bearing in mind, these will be the same people who advised her to reduce FODMAPs to control symptoms, and look how this has ended. I just got off the phone with the doctor and 
Honestly, I can't say I'm not disappointed with our plan. Basically what may be happening, why I'm kind of experiencing this kind of plateau and also some symptoms um, coming that I never had before is that it's possible that the biofilm disruptor was just not strong enough to really get to those deep mature colonies and therefore the antibiotic couldn't quite kill them off but now those more mature colonies are aggravated and they're angry. Well nothing quite like plucking things from thin air. And that may be why I'm now suddenly reacting to certain FODMAPs that I never reacted to before. So you know, like dairy. So it's not like I'm lactose intolerant. It's just that those more mature colonies are now kind of exposed and are feasting on the dairy and those FODMAPs. I don't even know what to say to this. Did she actually say it's like those colonies are exposed and feasting? Abby, they would be eating and feasting regardless of whether they were behind biofilms. They still need to eat and metabolize or they would die. It makes no sense to what she is saying. Now, unfortunately, all of my other options for biofilm disruptors and antibiotics and prokinetics are not considered safe while breastfeeding. So yeah, typical mom dilemma here. I'm faced with the very hard decision on whether or not to take care of my health or to continue to breastfeed my son. So on screen now you will see a document released by the National Health Service in the UK in the summer of 2020. As you can see, the document is titled, Rifaximin is the second line antibacterial treatment for the treatment of SIBO. This document breaks down the brand names of Rifaximin, the doses, the background and context of using Rifaximin, and also the summary of the latest evidence. The document also breaks down Rifaximin compared to other common antibiotics in SIBO treatments. One of the other antibiotic treatments that can be used is metronidazole. The balance of current evidence and clinical experience and the consensus of specialist opinion is that there is no established mutagenic or carcinogenic risk to infants breastfeeding from mothers receiving routine short-term course treatment from the antibiotic. Now it's obviously Abby's call on where she goes with treatment but there are alternative options available if she discusses this with her medical team. Yeah it's a really hard call but I think I'm gonna have to put this journey on pause until I'm ready to wean or my son's ready to wean and I'm sure he'd be totally fine to switch to formula or, or cow's milk at this stage. I, I don't know that I'm ready to, to end that journey too. You know, I fought so hard to breastfeed. Oh, so I'm not sure that I'm ready. I mean, I may reevaluate if this gets really bad and we can, we might just start this process up real quick again, but for now, I'm probably gonna have to take a little bit of a break. I love the fact that Abby is putting her baby first. She just needs to remember that the health of the milk that she is producing is based on the nutrients that she is eating, digesting, and also absorbing. If you have SIBO, then this bacteria can inhibit the rate of absorption of certain key nutrients. It's why many people with SIBO run into nutritional deficiencies with nutrients such as iron. Now, I'm sure she will keep checking her bloods, but this is important to do so because as the SIBO infection starts to increase again, she may very well run into issues and no doubt she will further modify her diet to control symptoms and this may cause her nutrient levels to drop. So as we wait for that day to come, I'm taking on a few additional supplements to help support my digestion. One is a probiotic, which is a little controversial since the concern is that you're adding bacteria to an overgrowth that's already there, which obviously is not what you want. But really early research does suggest that probiotic supplements can be effective as a SIBO treatment, both as a standalone and as like a follow-up treatment. So this study that Abby flashed up on screen, they gave the patients 500 milligram for five days. So this is way below the therapeutic dose of at least 1200 milligram a day recommended in the scientific literature. So those people would never see a benefit in five days with such a low dose. So comparing these patients to patients taking probiotics is absolutely pointless. The participants were also only screened for hydrogen. So again, they are discounting methane from the trial. So there is no real evidence to support probiotics 
antibiotic use as a treatment. SIBO is an accumulation of bacteria that causes excessive fermentation. Until the bacteria is removed, the person will continuously experience those types of problems. Adding in probiotics will do nothing for the removal of this bacteria. Out of everyone I have helped with SIBO, I have yet to find anyone who benefited from taking probiotics when the infection was still present. That's not to say there aren't people out there, it's just not something that I see. So I would always recommend on removing the bacteria rather than worrying about expensive probiotics. Next, I have added in a different prokinetic called Iberogast, which also has some good research to support its use. So I'm taking that with my meals and I'm also taking one ginger capsule in the morning when I wake up. I'm also still taking my betaine HCL at my meals to ensure adequate stomach acid for proper digestion. And anytime I'm eating things with dairy in it, I'm taking a lactate. And if I'm eating beans, I'll take a beano supplement just to be safe. Iberogast is very effective for many if you are battling constipation types of issues, but you certainly don't want to become over-reliant on it over the longer term. You want to fix the issues as quickly as possible so you are not having to rely on supplements. Now, the biggest and hardest adjustment, however, has been shifting the timing of my meals and snacks. As a mom, I think I've gotten into the habit of like constantly putting things into my mouth all day. Hey, that's what she said. But every time I do that, even if it's just like a little bite of my son's leftover sandwich or a few berries, I disrupt the migratory motor complex, which then makes it easier for bacteria to pool and populate. Lost for words. So it's been really quite a challenge for me because I am by nature such a grazer, which may or may not have been related to my SIBO in the first place. I also sometimes wonder if I'm by nature more of a grazer and like to have those multiple smaller meals in the day because eating a lot in one sitting feels bloating to me. But regardless, I am actively aiming now to have bigger sit down meals and waiting about three hours before I have another meal or snack. Humans are from a line of primates. Most primates spend their time grazing throughout the day, and most animal species also have migrating motor complexes. If grazing was a factor in the development of gut issues, then we would see consistent gut issues in species that graze consistently, which we don't. So again, I think that Abby is just clutching at straws. It's probably gonna take a while for my body to adjust to this routine, and it is requiring me to think a lot more about food and eating than I would like to. But I am just hoping that with time, this will become my normal routine. And more importantly, I hope it actually gives me some relief. Okay, update guys. I don't know what's going on, but I'm feeling so much better. I, it just kind of happened out of the blue and I'm not sure which supplement it was or, you know, which shift in my routine or if it's everything all at once, but I actually feel like I'm almost back to my antibiotic phase digestion, if you know what I'm saying. And it feels so good. And I'm back to tolerating dairy again. I don't know what the hell happened there, uh, which is really important because I got a ton of Ben and Jerry's in the freezer and a DQ ice cream cake that I need to enjoy this summer. So thank you very much, dairy gods. What do you even say to this? Abby will become the next vegetable police. Mark my words. It's just like you had one apple. It's like, oh, my life's over. It will be manipulation of diet and supplementation. I feel better, oh wait a minute, I feel worse, now I feel better, now I feel worse. Until she has fixed the SIBO, these issues are going nowhere and things will likely to get worse as Abby tries to manipulate and micromanage everything that she is eating. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to check out this one up here because I'm sure you will find it equally interesting. And the only other thing that's left for me to say is to remember to look after your body because it's the only place you have to live. And I'll see you next time.